Hello, I'm Alex Braden, and I listen to DesignCast from Shanghai, China. Hello, I'm JD, and I listen to DesignCast from Qingdao, China. Hi, I'm Chris Willauer, and I listen to DesignCast from Shanghai, China. Hello and welcome to DesignCast, a podcast where I interview a wide range of excellent guests in design and STEAM education to get their unique perspectives. My name is Jason Regan, and I use my 20 plus years of experience as a design educator to dig deep into complex issues. This podcast has one simple mission: to create a community of people around the world that are interested in design and STEAM education. Each episode, I chat with guests from all corners of the design world from classroom teachers to authors and even to educational consultants. We discuss a wide range of topics that we feel are relevant today. I do want to ask you that if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a review, rate, subscribe, share, or download from your favorite podcasting app. This helps the podcast get discovered by listeners that might not find it otherwise. Also, it helps me to continually define the direction of future guests and episodes. Feel free to drop by my website www.jasonreagan.ga to leave me a comment or to sign up to be considered as a future guest on future episodes. Also, don't forget to stop by Anchor and leave me a voice clip that could even end up in an upcoming show. Thanks for listening. So let's get to it. All right. Thanks again for joining me here on another edition of DesignCast. And so on this episode of DesignCast, I had the amazing opportunity to speak with Amanda Presky, who owns and operates Circuit Breaker Labs. It was so fascinating to learn how Amanda is using e-waste to create beautiful wearable art, jewelry, and framed pieces. I have to admit that my mind was totally engaged in thinking about how I can adapt her ideas and techniques in my own design classroom. I know that you're going to enjoy hearing what she has to say, and I am certain that you're going to want to put some of her techniques into use in your own classroom. So I know that you're going to enjoy this. I can't wait for you to hear it. If you are enjoying this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and share with your colleagues. We've seen an amazing amount of growth over the past year, and we want to see that continue to grow as long as people are enjoying what we're doing. So I do appreciate it, and I appreciate all the kind words that I continue to get from the growing DesignCast community. I appreciate those words, and that, that means so much to me being the one-man show that I am. If you have any ideas for the future podcasts that we might have, please uh, reach out to me through my website at www.jasonreagan.ga. And there's a contact form right there. You can also reach out to me through Anchor. And there's a link for that in the show notes where you can leave a voice message. And who knows, it might even turn up on a future podcast. So if you want to check out any of the links that we had from this episode with Amanda, please check out the show notes. And it's listed all right there, as well as we talk about it towards the end of the podcast. So please have your pencil or your pen and your paper ready to take notes. So sit back, enjoy what we have to offer here from Amanda Presky. Welcome back to another edition of Design Cast, and I am super excited today to have Amanda Presky with me today. And so, Amanda, how are you? 
Fantastic. Thanks for having me. I am really looking forward to hearing more about what you do. And so if you don't mind, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and yeah, just share with folks who are listening who you are? Hi. So my background is formally in chemistry, but I've been creative and making things since I was a kid and I never grew out of it. So all through my years in college, I had been working on a side project, making and selling my handmade jewelry. And when I was in graduate school, it just sort of exploded. So what I do is turn electronic waste. So that's anything from broken circuit boards, resistors, keyboard parts, all that kind of thing into wearable art and jewelry and accessories, which I've turned into a business I called Circuit Breaker Labs. So it's a combination of science and art all, in, all wrapped in together. I am really interested to hear more about this. And I see here that you have a, a PhD. What's your PhD in? It's in chemistry. Of all the sciences, I feel like chemistry is one of the very most hands-on making right in front of you kind of things. So that really appealed to me. That's fantastic. So you started, I think, pretty young. So what was sort of, you said it exploded in graduate school. How, how long before that were you making jewelry and, and doing art like that? I started selling when I was a teenager. I think I was 14 or 15 when I did my first craft show. And after that first taste of entrepreneurial success, I haven't looked back. That's fantastic. And so, uh, you know, as a lot of listeners, they're educators and we work with young people and we're finding more and more often that a lot of young people are interested in business and they're interested in doing kind of their own thing, whether it's making apps or whether it's actually creating physical items and, and things like that. And so what sorts of things, like what prepares someone to be a, a teenage business owner? <laughs> a really interesting question. And I must say from my background, there wasn't any real source that propelled me in that direction. It was more self-founded. Basically, I had made too much jewelry and I needed more money to buy more supplies. So the obvious solution was to sell it. And so I just wung it. Uh, I set stuff out. I learned about merchandising. I learned about pricing. I sort of learned all that stuff just by doing, because in that time, the internet wasn't so much of a resource yet. So I found it easier to just try things. And that was in my nature. That's probably why I also wound up in chemistry, because I love setting up experiments and designing ways to test those. For the entrepreneurial side, which of course I didn't realize as a kid, it was really interesting and a lot of fun to see how making changes affected results. So for kids nowadays, I think it's probably a lot more accessible. I think if kids are given the opportunity to set out with their idea and see what happens, providing them with resources like that could be really beneficial. That's fantastic. Again, I have a, a lot of folks who are listening who teach teenage age kids, and a lot of them have questions about how they can give back to their community or how they can start a business or, or those kinds of things. So I think it's great to hear that you just kind of had a had a go at it. Not being afraid to fail is incredibly important. So it sounds like you have that sort of mentality. And so that's fantastic. And w when did you decide that e-waste and things that were needing to be recycled or reused was the direction you should head with your, your art? That whole metamorphosis began when I was an undergrad in, in college. Uh, I had just gotten into using resin as a creative medium. And I found its versatility to be incredibly interesting. Um, I had set up tons of experiments. I was putting everything in resin. I was casting. I was using it as a coating. I just wanted to see where I could push it. In the process, I realized that in the labs, had they were just full of old equipment that nobody wanted to get rid of or didn't know how to. And I thought, well, this is kind of silly. Let's open it up and for science, see what's going on in there, see how it looks, see if there's anything in here I could use to create something. And so I found that I was really attracted to the way circuit boards look. My background being in chemistry, I don't know anything about how they really work. And of course, I've learned quite a bit since. From that standpoint, it was a very aesthetic approach. I thought it was really interesting. So I sought to put it under resin and see how it would turn out. And because I was setting up my work at craft shows, I had a direct line to people who were not afraid to tell me their opinion about it. And I discovered that despite what I thought, people really found it interesting. And even people who didn't know what circuit boards were could appreciate that it looked really interesting. 
So I really leaned into that because that was where a lot of comments were coming from. It, it was overshadowing my other handmade work. So it, it took quite a few years to really get it to the point where it was polished and refined and that I had my own unique voice with regards to my specific line of work. And that's how Circuit Breaker Labs became. I am super excited to hear about that. But one thing I want to draw attention to just real quick is one of the things actually we teach in, in school with design is identifying your target audience and then finding access to them. So I love to hear that you're actually doing that in, in real practice. And so that's fantastic that you were getting real-time feedback because not all designers or makers can do that. You know, a lot of times they make things and it's just sent out through internet orders or whatever. So do you still go to those kinds of shows and do things still, or how does that work? I absolutely do. And for that reason, that's one of the major reasons is immediate feedback. You can watch customers interact with what you've set out and they don't need to say anything to share their opinion. You can tell. And so I also think it's really important to talk directly with customers, especially as a maker. People want to know who's making the thing that they're looking to buy. And it's important that it's locally made or handmade. And so all of those values are very easily conveyed when I'm talking with my customers face to face. I have to say your work is absolutely stunning. I, I think it's fantastic. And if I will have everything in the show notes and how folks can see that. Can you tell me more about Circuit Breaker Labs and when did it start? You know, what kind of work do you guys do now? That kind of thing. I'll set the official inception date at 2007. That's when I really started to get into working with circuit boards. It probably took another couple of years before I really grew into it and expanded. I started off making cast resin pendants and moved to making cufflinks. What I found is that circuit board, it appeals to a very wide audience. And I find that a lot of men or masculine people are very attracted to the hard lines and details in the circuit board. So I made a conscientious effort to design products for men. And that was another reason setting up at craft shows was really important because that gave me access to people who were actually going to be using these products and so they could help guide my design decisions. As I finished my PhD, we're going to fast forward to 2016, that's when I jumped into running Circuit Breaker Labs as a full-time job career. And it was amazing how much brain space I had after graduating. So now I wasn't doing two jobs simultaneously. I could put 100% of my effort into Circuit Breaker Labs. And one of the fears I had making the switch to being full-time was not having enough ideas. But what I didn't realize was having 100% of my brain available for the business meant that I had way more ideas. And I'm still, I wouldn't call it a struggle, but it was definitely something I didn't have to worry about. And so now I'm finding my days are spent coming up with all sorts of new products. Also really listening to my customers whenever they request custom items. I'm always excited and intrigued by what they ask me to make, having no idea what my limitations are. And so I take on every custom request as an opportunity to try something new. And so many of my new product designs and development have been a result of custom projects that just turned out so great. I wanted to find a way to incorporate them into my line. So for example, the last couple of years, I've really leaned into creating framed art pieces and holiday decor. And so what I'm finding is that even adding those has expanded my possibilities exponentially. Um, I really like creating layers and playing with color and shape. I have to say that looking at both of those things, the holiday items, as well as the, the framed pictures of, of the different sh states and the shapes and different things that you've done, it's, it's just absolutely beautiful. I'm really interested in a couple of things. First off, do you have to use a certain kind of resin so that it will have an adhesive property to the material you're using? Or what? how do you determine that? I know your chemistry, I'm sure, has helped a lot with how to bond those things together. But do you have to use different kinds of resin depending on what it is? Or how does that work? What I find with the resin specifically is that it depends on what the end use of the product will be. So a lot of resins will have different degrees of brittleness. And so if you're trying to make a piece that's going to be flexible, those two things aren't going to cooperate with each other very well. You also have to consider what you're doing with the resin. So are you using it as a coating or using it as a cast or a casted piece? And so the types of resin you use for those are going to be very different. I found out through experimentation that resins designed for coatings will not work to cast because the high volume in a small space 
will create an exothermic reaction, which is not something you want in your studio. <laughs> so I don't have too much trouble with adhesion, but it's more about casting versus coating. I've seen a lot of videos online, like where folks are using resin to create tables out of different things and, or pencils and they spin it and then they, you know, use a lathe to do different things. And so I wasn't sure if that was the kind of resin you were using or, you know, that sort of thing. It's really high gloss and really, really clear, isn't it? The kind of resin that you're using? Yes, it is. The type of resin I use is a marine-based resin, so it's durable, but not so durable that it causes brittleness problems. And the clarity comes from years of chemical research. Resin formulations have come a long way in just in the last decade alone, and so I'm finding that there are much better options now for very clear and colorless resins. And the colorless part is very important since a lot of plastics tend to be UV reactive and will yellow over time. So I definitely am very careful about choosing materials so that over time the piece will still look as good as it was on the first day. Something that you would never know without just constant experimentation, right? I mean, it seems like that's been a, a theme throughout is trying things out and not being afraid to fail, I guess, is, is a safe situation of, you know, everything you try is just another practice round, you know, and then try to get things right. And you never know till you try. And so that's so, that's just really so interesting to me. And when you're talking about this e-waste, how do you get these materials that you're then using? Are, are you buying just old computers? or do people send you things? How does it work? A little bit of everything. I work with some corporate entities to supply e-waste, especially in colors that are very rare, like orange and purple. I have an e-cycling trade-in program. So any of my customers who have stuff laying around they want to get rid of, I can take it. Or at the very least, I can help them figure out what to do with it because I find that closing that loop is very important. The stuff should not be in landfills. It needs to be handled by a certified recycler. And every time I do craft shows, the more I do, the more people find out about it. And they say, oh, I've got all this stuff in my basement. So I'm a, a basement emptier. <laughs> Um, and I find it's people love having a outlet for this stuff. They want to get rid of it. They just don't know how. So I feel like part of my role at Circuit Breaker Labs is also just helping people figure out what to do and how to handle it. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. That's fantastic. I find that people do want to be sustainable, but they often just don't know how to be. I think it's great that you're doing that. I'm really stoked. And one of the things that's so interesting to me is how we can even scale this to even use in schools. So I want to hear more from you about that later. But what have been some of the challenges in starting your own business and going about making things for the public? What's, what's kind of been some of the challenging things for you? As a micro business, I think one of the most difficult things is just getting word out that we even exist. I joined Etsy back in 2006 when they were just in their infancy, and that was something that was incredible. Open doors to being able to sell my work to anyone on the planet that had an internet connection. So going in that vein, just looking for ways to connect with people online um, is one thing that while more available now, also has its own set of caveats, but really it's just finding people who like what I do and trying to get in front of them. Tell me a little bit about operating in a COVID world. How is that affecting you at the moment? That has definitely affected operations. About 70% of my annual efforts are based on exhibiting at live events. So I got to do two events this year in January and February before everything got shut down. So I really had to come up with new ways of reaching my customers and people who are interested in what I do. So I've done a lot more live videos, a lot more streaming. I've been on social media a lot more and I've changed the way I share online. I've made an effort to reframe the way I talk about what I do, make it more open to discussion. I'm an extrovert and I am really missing interacting with people and talking about science and engineering and what I'm doing and e-waste and all of those things that are related to what I do. 
And so I'm trying to reorganize how I interact with people through social media because that's the only way right now that I can communicate with people. Um, it also, of course, impacted revenue. So in March, I had to do a quick reorganization to figure out what we had, how we could meet current needs, and that ended up being masks. So I jumped on that wagon and made handmade face masks in typical Circuit Breaker Labs fashion. They were all science-based, science and engineering-based. So that helped get some revenue flowing, help people who love STEM express that visually and meet the need for masks since there was a shortage. But what that also enabled me to do was have enough revenue that I could bring back my studio assistants Every decision I make is about the people who work here. I'm always trying to do things that are in the best interest of them. And during COVID, I really wanted to make sure that they had a job. So I had to pivot quickly and make sure that I could take care of them too. Do you think being in a micro business allowed you to be nimble to pivot like that? Do you find that to be true? Definitely. I mean, I can go from idea to execution to online all within hours. The mask took a little bit longer because I had to dust out. <laughs> I had to dust off my sewing machine and remember how it worked all over again. But once I was into it, I was popping out masks 18 hours a day. But yeah, I know I noticed that even a major retailers, it took them five or six months to really get masks out. They seemed very slow. And so that's one thing I really love about being CEO and manufacturer and marketer is that I control every step of that process, which can also be a problem at the same time. But from the nimbleness perspective, it's definitely much better to be a micro business. Yeah, I know closing that loop as tightly as possible with that whole process you just talked about is incredibly important. And and one thing I meant to ask you earlier, I'm sorry to shift gears so quickly. Thank you so much for sharing what you have so far. But how are you manipulating the materials that you have? And what I mean by that is, do you laser cut them? Do you cut them with a handsaw? Do you use acid? How do you How do you get these shapes out of these things that are not in that shape? Yeah, so when I first started, it was a Dremel tool with a metal cutoff wheel. And currently, I use a combination of drill press for cutting discs, and everything else is cut using a CNC router. So I can't use a laser cutter, mostly because I'm worried about my health. If you are unaware, circuit boards are layers of fiberglass and metals, heavy metals, flame retardants, all sorts of things that you do not want in your lungs. And so the way a laser cutter works would end up producing gaseous circuit board. And even with ventilation, I'm not confident that I could operate that safely. Um, the other issue is because circuit boards have all these different materials, they have different absorption points. And lasers do not have generally variable wavelengths when cutting. So I fear that some things might explode, some things might melt, some things might burn. And that just doesn't sound like a situation I even want to be a part of. So I take the safe route. I use a CNC router, which is basically a fancy drill bit that cuts through the material in a 2D plane. At least for my purposes, it's a 2D plane or a 2D surface. So that allows me to create these really interesting shapes and cut through the material with ease. Fantastic. I actually am glad to hear that because I know a lot of teachers have, you know, desktop CNC routers and CNC lathes and things like that. So that's fantastic. And what sort of software or application do you use to do your actual 2D design in? You don't want to know the answer to that. <laughs> I use a combination of open source um, design software. So things like uh, GIMP and paint.net, anything that can handle a SVG. That's what I was hoping to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, because I'm, I'm thinking through as you're talking, how I could transfer what you're talking about and make it into an actionable unit with my students. And it may not be that we use circuit boards. We might use some other recycled material, but I'm, I'm thinking about the workflow that you you've talked about, about meeting your customer and then, you know, thinking of ideas and brainstorming. You're, you're actually describing what we call a design cycle right now. And so I love to hear that. And this is fantastic because open source makes teachers smile in my profession. So I did want to hear that. So fantastic. Thank you. Can I ask you about what the vision is for your company? What do you, if we're in a post COVID world where things are kind of running back it's in a somewhat quasi-normal state what do you see for your company that is twofold 
So ever since I was, I don't know, 10 years old, I've always wanted to own a bead store. That has shifted away from beads, but the store part has never left. I've always wanted to have a brick and mortar where I could interact with customers on the daily. And the second is that I really want a family feeling in the company. So I want to know everybody. I want to be friends if possible. I want to cultivate basically what it was like in grad school, a lab where we knew everyone, we knew everyone's family. We all worked together, even though we worked on different projects. Everything we did helped everyone else in the lab because if they had a gap in their knowledge, there was someone else there to fill in. And so it was a very collaborative environment um, where we were all invested in everyone's success. And so it sounds a little cheesy, but I love that feeling where I know people have got my back, that they want me to do well. And so I want to create a company that feels like that. So what that means is that I can't grow past a certain number because that will be impossible to maintain. I believe business should serve the customers and the people in the company. And when you get too big, I find it very much not possible to serve the people that work for you. When you have a business, you don't have a business without people that work with you. So if you're not taking care of your employees and treating them like humans, I, I don't understand why people want to be in a situation like that. So anyway, I would like to keep things small and intimate but continue to grow, continue to share our work and have a place where we can share about science and tech and making all in one space. So however that manifests over the next couple of years or over my, the course of my career, I'll be keeping those two things in mind the whole time. I'd love to hear that. And, and I think anyone would want to work in a place like that. And where do people who work with you come from? <laughs> what I mean by that is what kind of backgrounds are they coming from? So far, it has been people that I find through the job search process. So what I find is that because my process is so specialized, you don't need a background in anything. I can train you. I can employ just about anybody. As long as they're willing to learn, I'm willing to teach. And what I do is I bring people in. I look at what their natural interests and skill sets are and then guide them towards steps in our business process that best suit what they enjoy and where their talents lie. As I grow, I may have to change that and hire people who are specifically trained in things like marketing or finance or whatnot. Um, but for now, um, while we're very small, I can train everybody. That's amazing. Uh, I love it. And that family feel that you're talking about, that sounds that sounds really great. And so what are you really excited about at the moment? You know, I mean, right now it could be easy to be very down on things, <laughs> depressed. What, what are you excited about right now? I think my COVID mindset really turned around about a month ago when I found out I was accepted to a month-long outdoor holiday market here in Washington, D.C. I was just so excited about the prospect of being able to meet people face-to-face -face again, masked, of course. But outdoors and the holiday market itself has such a warm, creative atmosphere. And I'm just really looking forward to getting out, getting my work out there, talking to people about science and art again. And I just can't wait for that. That sounds really exciting. And I, I'm sure you'll absolutely be inspired and ready to make even more stuff you haven't even thought about yet. And so that sounds awesome. Where do you get inspiration for your ideas? And I know a lot from your customers. Are there other places you look to get inspired for things that you do? I'm never looking for inspiration actively. It always seems to just happen. Some of it is from customer ideas where someone will ask for one thing and then my brain will just go, oh, what about this? This is completely different, but those one idea will spark another, will spark another. But also being out in the world, just seeing what my customers are wearing, how they are expressing themselves, especially if they're a scientist, how they're choosing to do that. Also, I share my work a lot on Instagram. Can't help be on Instagram and not be inspired by all the artists that are also on there. I find Instagram to be a fantastic place to do the death scroll, you know, where you just keep going and going and going. Uh, and it's, it's fantastic because I'm interested in art and, and architecture and all kinds of things and drone photographs and things like that. And so, oh my gosh, I could go all day and just look at stuff people have created. I find it to be incredibly inspirational. And of course, I'm following you. 
to see the things that you and your company are doing, which is great. If people want to get in touch with you and find out more about what you're doing, what's the best way to do that? The simplest way is to Google Circuit Breaker Labs. And that handle I use as my web domain, as Instagram and Facebook. And if you want to reach out directly, it's info at circuitbreakerlabs.com. I will make sure that all of that goes into the show notes so people can hear that. And I assume that on your website and other places, if they wanted to request or commission work, that's the way they can do it? Definitely. I have listings set up to make ordering custom work as simple as possible. But if you have something really outside the box, you just email me and I'm more than happy to walk you through my process. And I assume you have international shipping? Of course. Do you find that you have a lot of international customers or most folks domestic? It's very much domestic U.S. based orders, but I do ship probably 10 to 15 percent end up being international. Well, let's hope after this that you'll get a few percentage points uh, international more (laughs) after that, because I'm telling you, I can't say enough about how beautiful your work is. I mean, it's, it's really, really great to see. And anytime I see something that I think, wow, that is so innovative because I just have not thought about that sort of thing before. And so I, I'm one of those guys who would be totally like, oh, that's so cool, you know, kind of thing at one of your shows. So I'm, I'm one of those guys. <laughs> they would Excellent. definitely be keen for that. So <laughs> Amanda, thank you so much for being here. And I would love to keep in touch with you and maybe even have you come and virtually speak to my class sometime and, and things like that. But this has been amazing. I'm really excited about your work and I can't wait to continue to see where it goes. Hey, thank you so much. It was so awesome to be here. I hope you enjoyed that episode of DesignCast. I'm Jason, your host, and I produced and created this podcast. If you have any input, I would love to hear from you. And I look forward to seeing you again really soon.